So um, wonderful to see all of you here this morning. Um, we had an incredible, incredible Good Friday service Friday night. Um, just amazing. And just to be here today, it's my favorite Sunday of the year. And uh, I want to just read a little bit of the, of the story of the resurrection of Jesus. Amazing story. And uh, we're going we're gonna to take it this morning out of Luke's account. And it says, very, very early that Sunday morning, the woman made her way to the tomb, carrying the spices that they had prepared. And among them were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, Jesus' mother. Arriving at the tomb, they discovered that the huge stone covering the entrance had been rolled aside. So they went in to look, but the tomb was empty. The body of Jesus was gone. They stood there, stunned and perplexed, and suddenly two men in dazzling white robes, shining like lightning, appeared above them. Terrified, the, w- the women fell to the ground on their faces. The men in white said to them, why would you look for the living one in a tomb? He is not here, for he is risen. Have you forgotten what he said to you while he was still in Galilee? The Son of Man is destined to be handed over to sinful men to be nailed to a cross, and on the third day he will rise again. All at once they remembered his words. Leaving the tomb, they went to break the news to the eleven and to all the others of what they had seen and heard. When the disciples heard the testimony of the men, it made no sense, and they were unable to believe what they heard. But Peter jumped up and ran the entire distance to the tomb to see for himself. Stooping down, he looked inside and discovered it was empty. There was only uh, the linen sheet lying there. Staggered by this, he walked away wondering what it meant. You might be here today uh, because Easter is just, it's the right thing to do to go to church on Easter. Christmas and Easter. I I, I used to think that way. And I want to let you know today that although that's an awesome thing is, you know, being at church on Easter... The ramifications of what we just read go far beyond that. It's more than just once a year or, or you know, once a season. It's, it's life-changing. It changes your every day. And so there are some ramifications to the resurrection for you and I. Um, number one, our sins are dealt with, and we are declared righteous because of all that Jesus did for us, which is amazing. God takes away the shame and the guilt for our sins and, and we stand before a holy God in a right condition, not because of ourselves, but because of what Jesus did. It's a new beginning. The old is behind us, including our fears and our guilt. It's a new beginning because of what Jesus did for us. It, it brings us a hope for tomorrow. It brings us a hope for the future. Um, and, and it's that hope that transforms our lives, knowing that that God has our lives in the palm of his hand, that God has a plan for each of us. And most of all, the greatest uh, ramification of the resurrection is that we have friendship with the Son of God, with Jesus. We are declared friends of God. And, and I, just, I just love that. I love the fact that a new story is being written for each of you right now because of what Jesus did. And do you know that your stories, your testimonies, our living sermons, the way you live your life, the way, uh, uh, the way people see the, the transformation that takes place in your life. As a pastor, I get to see it in most of you on a weekly basis. I remember when some of you first came here and you were struggling and you didn't necessarily believe, but you needed to belong. And, 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 and now I see so many of you, your, your countenance is different. You have changed. You are, you are different. The way you love people, the way you conduct yourselves... I see everyday miracles in you. So your lives, your testimonies are are worth a thousand sermons. And today we have some life stories um, of some people in both services, people that you maybe have seen working in the parking lot or or here in the back, and and you don't know really that much about them. But I just think that um, to hear someone's story is so powerful. Don't you agree? So we, we've, we've got some, amen, let's give him a hand. It's not easy, it's not easy being vulnerable in front of a group of people, so we need to pray for them. <laughs> so um, this is Doc, this is Mark, both of these guys have incredible stories of, of coming to faith in Christ, and, um, um, and I'm just so grateful that you guys were willing 
to be vulnerable and just to kind of share your story. Because I know you, both of your hearts, you want someone here today to see your life and say, man, if God can do it in them, he can do it in my life. So, Doug, I'm going to start with you real quick. <clears throat> um, can you just give us a little bit of a window into what life was like before you found Jesus? Yeah, about five years ago, my life started to go um, downhill, and I started going to a very, very dark place. Um, and I didn't realize that I was actually entering in a valley, and it was a very scary place, and I didn't know where I was going to go. Um, but by the grace of God, I was saved. So it was, uh, it was really scary. It was, um, it was a lot of drinking, uh, things, other things I won't talk about, um, but it, was, um, it wasn't who I was. And... Um, and I wasn't sure where my life was going to go at that point in time. Um, I don't know if I actually contemplated suicide or not, but I did hit a crossroad, and it was completely, completely black. <clears throat> and just your marriage was going through some difficult times, right? Yes, my marriage was going through some hard times. Uh, my business was failing. Um, I mean, it, it was everything under, you could imagine uh, that was going so-called wrong for me. And, um, and I had it all. I had three homes, a boat, uh, marriage, a uh, wonderful stepdaughter, a good business. Had it all. And I was losing everything. And at that time in your life, <clears throat> would it be safe to say that you were not fulfilled? You, you, there, was, there was a gaping hole in your heart? Without a doubt, there was something was missing. Um, and as I look back now on my life, um, I, re I realized that there was, God was reaching out to me. Um, he selected me, and in turn, he has saved me, and now he's proclaimed me to the world. Awesome. <clears throat> <clears throat> now you're going to hear two different stories, but the, the conclusion is very similar of what happened. Mark, tell us a little bit about your life before coming to Christ. I would say that I thought my life was built on a rock, but what I found out, my life was built on the sand. And what was missing for me was that foundation. Uh, I had a relationship with God, but it wasn't the relationship that I have now. I have truly found Jesus. Uh, like dog, I was very successful. I had a business. I had a beautiful home. I had a beautiful family. And one by one, it all slipped through my fingers. And I think the breaking point for me is when my wife came to me one day and said she was leaving me because that was the last thing that I had. I had already lost my business. I was in the middle of losing my home. And all of a sudden, the thing that I thought that would be there forever, I didn't do the right thing, and I destroyed that as well. Then one day, Billy Vignola, a neighbor of mine, knocked on my door, and he said, how you doing, Mark? And I said, I'm doing okay. And I also was going through some health issues. I had a heart attack that 80% of the people die when they have that heart attack. I have diabetes. They told me they were going to have to take my foot. Then... The doctor came to me and he said to me, Mark, he goes, you're in the 1% range. Because once an infection gets into your bone, we usually take that part of the body. But your body has formed a membrane over that infection and we're not going to have to take your foot. Now, these were all things that God was doing for me that I didn't even realize because as I came to Jesus, the one thing that really stayed with me is through all those really, really rough times, God was right there. He was right there with me. And yeah, I didn't hindsight know Hindsight is it. 20 -20. Hindsight yes. is twenty twenty. At the time, you, don't, you think you're all alone. I, I thought I was all alone. And I just felt everything was out of control. I had no more control in my life. No matter what I did, didn't work anymore. I, I, there's probably a lot of people here today that can identify with that completely. Um, so, Dog, um, <clears throat> you were in this place in your life where you were, uh, everything was coming apart. You were feeling empty. You were feeling frustrated. Um, and like most guys, we take a lot of pride in the fact that we can fix things, 
that we can, you know, with our hands and with our talents and our abilities, that we can, we can uh, make life great for us and our families. But when, when we get to a place where we feel like no matter what we try, it's not working, there's a sense of frustration that sets in. And you were, you were living frustrated for a long time, right, about life and about just how everything was, hap- everything was going wrong. Oh, extremely frustrating. Um, I was so frustrated, it was, the words can't even describe it. And I just looked back, and as where God started to work with me. Um, you know, I remember Craig. Uh, he, uh, so Craig Amadimo, who's part of the harbor, was an influence in your life. He was. He, uh, he actually ministered to me in a parking lot at Suffolk County National Bank a number of years ago. Um, Did then, you think he was crazy? No, actually not. I was actually, um, I listened. Okay. I really did listen to him. And then one day, Wes Fay was in my office, and he, uh, I, he had been listening to me for quite some time. Thank you, Wes. Where are you? Um, so he was uh, listening, and he came to me one day, that day, and said, Doug, you know what you need in your life now? And I said, what's that? And he goes, you need God in your life. So we selected a Sunday that I was going to meet with him here, be his guest. I woke up that Sunday morning, hung over, could have very easily rolled back into bed and not did it. But um, I made a commitment to my friend, I came to church, and by the middle of this uh, service, it was, go ahead. So I just want to back up for a second, and because I think this is important for all of our volunteers to hear. What was your take when you, when you got out of the car? What, uh, because I think that's very important. When you were walking in the building, when you were, um, did you feel welcome, or did you feel like you were a visitor? all alone. I, I, I think that's important for everyone to hear because that, that actually helps create an environment for the person who's here for the first time to feel relaxed, right? How did you feel? Oh, very relaxed. Um, you know, I was, I was a little nervous, but I was, always, I was very relaxed. I knew I had friends already, and I came to uh, the harbor, and it was always welcomed and loved, and hence why I do the parking lot now. Um, You're the only one that will dress up in an Easter Bunny outfit in the parking lot. Well, the only reason I didn't do that today was for you. So. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Because I would be really uncomfortable interviewing an Easter Bunny right now, honestly, just to be real. So go ahead. Me too. Uh, so, uh, Wes, I came to church, and by the middle of service, it was, Pastor Mike, it was you and I. There was no one else in the congregation. And the message that day was entitled, You. And uh, my, de- my, um, And my life changed that day. A year ago, I was baptized. And, uh... you have to move on, Ms. I'm going to move on. We get it. We get it. So... Mark, uh, you have an interesting story about our connect groups and Billy Rignola, who's part of the harbor. T- tell us that whole story of how we got you to a connect group. So uh, Billy, like I said, was my neighbor and uh, we, we talked. We were always friends and uh, he invited me to a connect group on Wednesday morning. And uh, this was a bunch of uh, gentlemen that were in similar situations that I was where my marriage was falling apart, and uh, he invited me to the connect group. At first, I didn't want to go, but at that point, I felt, why not? Because, again, I didn't know how to fix anything anymore. I just, it was like trying to hold water in my hand. It just kept sifting through. So I went to the connect group, and I met a bunch of guys that I have to tell you, I fell in love with. I love every single one of these people in my connect group. They showed me I wasn't alone. And they showed me that with faith and prayer that I could put my life back together. While me and my wife were separated, I think my wife found Jesus as well. And 
when I seen the change in her, I knew instantly that that's what I wanted. I also want to mention that Luca Pony and Teresa have been rocks for me. I have been able to lean on them so much. And anytime I had any questions or needed guidance in which way to go, I would go to Lou and I would ask him. And he just knew the right thing to say every single time. And not only did he know the right things to say, they were right, <laughs> which is quite amazing. That's great. So do you remember the moment that you fully surrendered? Do you remember? Tell us about that. Yes. Uh, this is where my story is going to tie in with dogs, and I don't even know if he realizes this, but the first time I came to the harbor was to see him get baptized. I was going awesome. to my usual church, but when uh, we were in the connect group and I heard he was getting baptized, I really wanted to go, so that was my first time that I actually came to the harbor to watch dog get baptized. It was so moving and so touching to me, and I said, that's what I want. <laughs> so... I would say that was probably somewhere in there was the turning point to where I think what I found is I found a relationship with Jesus. Jesus, I realized, was there all the time, and he was sitting right there, and he was probably talking to me, but I wasn't listening. I thought I knew it all, but I didn't. God knew it all. Amen. Amen. That's awesome. That's awesome. <clears throat> do you remember, I'm sure you do, that moment where you just said, God, you can just have it all? T tell us about, you know, that experience. Um, it actually started the, the first day I was here, and the message was you. And it was no exaggeration when I say it was, there was no one else in the congregation. It was myself and Pastor Mike. Um, and forever did change my life. Um, I've worked very hard at uh, being more Christ-like every day. I have people to thank uh, in this congregation. Lou, where are you? Teresa, Vinny, Craig, yourself, um, the Harbor team, and the congregation. Um, without you all, um, I don't know where I would have been right now. So thank you. And, and serving has been a big part of that, right? Being a part of our volunteer community. You, you, right, you weren't here very long, and you were right in serving. Is that, is that true? Uh, yeah, right, almost, um, I'd say within a few months, um, I started to serve. And um, I had a, felt a calling to be out in the parking lot. So <laughs> who knows me? I love it out there. <laughs> I told Dog, if this pastor thing doesn't work out, I want to be out there working with him. So we're if you see me out there with a sign one Sunday, you'll know that something went wrong during the week. So. We're going to have a fight there, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> but I am not wearing an Easter bunny outfit. I just want you, <laughs> I want, I want you to know right off the bat. So I'll wear it like a superhero, Iron Man or something, but nothing else. So, um, <laughs> so um, both of you guys are miracles on how you've come to Christ. You've came to Christ later in life, which is a miracle in itself. Um, can you describe to us the difference now that Christ has made in your life? What, like, how is life different now than compared to before you came to Christ? I'm going to have you answer that, Mark. It's totally different. I'm a different person. I am more patient, although not totally yet. I'm working on it. <laughs> and I just am so thankful. See, I always thought that I was the one carrying the burden, but I was not. It was God that was carrying my burden for me. And now that I've come to realize that, I am so touched. I am so blessed because all I want to do is to try to help somebody else. I want somebody else to feel what it is that I feel. I want somebody else to be saved the way that I've been saved. 
because it is truly such a wonderful thing. And you have to give up not only your heart, but your soul and your mind to the Lord. And when you do that, when you're able to do that, then all the reward just comes flooding back. That's good. That's really good. Dog, how about you? I'll answer it in this way. If the Lord can save me and change me and make me a better man, if there's anyone out there that's questioning that, do not surrender yourself to the Lord. It is the most amazing experience you can ever encounter. And I, um, I want to add to that that I've seen a tremendous inner joy and a, and a peace rest on you since the first day I met you. You, you, there is a joy in you, and uh, you love life, and, and you get your butt kicked on a regular basis, like we all do as we're growing in God. How many got their butt kicked this week, spiritually? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're so, but, but what I love about you is you, you just get back up and brush yourself off and keep going for it, um, but there's such a, a dramatic a transformation in your life, and you, you too, Mark. I remember when you first started coming. Um, uh, so what advice would you give someone sitting here today, that this is kind of new to them, but they're, they're, they've identified with something that one of you guys have said. Um, what advice would you give them today um, in regards to coming to Christ and what, what it's like? It's not about joining the harbor. It's not about this church. It's not about a denomination, but it's about a relationship with your creator. So what advice would you give to someone that's searching for that today? Do not be afraid to ask for help. Find someone that you can confide in, that you can trust. Someone that you know where your deepest secrets are safe and that you can call on 24-7, 365. Know that and walk with them to find Jesus, find the Lord, and have that Holy Spirit with you. Um, and again, if it can be done for me, it can be done for anyone. Mark, I'm going to ask you the same question. I would say the first thing for me that I had to do was I had to let go. I had to realize that God was in control. And if you're at that point where everything you're doing, everything you're trying, things that used to work for so many years that all of a sudden don't, just ask Jesus into your life. Ask God for the answers because he will give them to you. It's been amazing. And I just wish that somehow everybody could see the way that I feel inside, the love that I have for God and Jesus and the sacrifice that Jesus made for me so that I could be sitting on this stage right at this moment. Amen. Well, you're looking at two radically changed lives. How long has it been for you since you've been serving God? How many years? Uh, about a year and a half. About a year and a half. How about you, Doug? Well, just over two years. It's just amazing, and and uh, I'll never forget um, the story of when um, in in the deeper class, um, Lou finally convinced you to pray in the group. You didn't want to pray, and and it was one of the greatest stories I ever heard. When you prayed, it was so good. It was actually Scott Schneider. Oh, it was Scott Schneider. Okay, all right, and uh, um, it was. I remember you were surprised. You surprised yourself after it was over with. Oh, immensely so. I mean, I, God was giving me the words that day. So we love you guys. We're so proud of you. And thank you for being vulnerable, of, of being up here, kind of sharing your stories. Um, and, you know, anyone can approach you guys after today, right, and just ask you questions. Absolutely. And, and By all means. Yeah. So uh, we love these guys so much. Can we give it up for Mark and Dog today? You guys are awesome. Thank you. So I know... All of you personally, I've heard your stories, and um, what you're going to see today is that um, everyone has a different path until you get to the cross, and then it all becomes the same, which is amazing. And so, um, Stephanie, I'm going to start with you, because I know you're not nervous or anything, 
And, uh, uh, but Stephanie, you have an amazing story of what God has done in your life in just the last year. So can you take us back a year ago and share with us what was going on in your life? Yes. Um, a year ago, I was um, very heavy into drugs. I was a heroin addict, and um, I was in a very bad way. Um, I wasn't living right. I wasn't being honest. Um, I was just living a lie day after day. And it was very, very hard to keep up that lie, but it was harder to stop using drugs to, to deal with what I'd caused. Um, and I just was living chaotically. And I wasn't stopping. And I didn't want to stop. And um, found myself um, overdosed in my car. And that was a year ago this week? A year ago this week, yes. Um, I was dead, not breathing, no pulse, blue. Um, and I was found by a neighbor who just happened to be walking out of his house. And he pulled me out of the car and he did CPR on me until the ambulance got there. And um, they had to use this drug called Narcan to get me out of this overdose. And it took four tries um, just to get me out of it. Don't they usually give up after once or twice? They usually do, yes. Two times is, is you know, a lot. Three is pushing it. After three, if they don't have a pulse or you're not back, they usually give up. But this EMT gave me a fourth and um, I came out of it. And um, I was out for quite some time, no oxygen, you know, and uh, there was fear that there would be brain damage and, and everything because I, you know, was out for so long, but I really was fine. I came out of that um, fine. It's amazing. So then, so then, <laughs> if that wasn't bad enough, yeah. what happened right after that? Because it, it got a little worse for your for you. Yes, um, they arrested me <laughs> in the hospital. Um, I had my daughter with me; she was in the car, so um, I was, you know, arrested for endangering her. And they took her from me. I had to sign away. Uh, my daughter couldn't talk to her, I couldn't see her, and then they put me in jail. And I was in jail for five days. But so if that's not bad enough, you're now um, withdraw you're having withdrawal symptoms while you're in jail. Yes, and it's terrible. And they don't do anything for you when you're in jail. So for the first time in my life, I had to really just go through this. Um, and sit with myself. And I was in 23-hour lockdown, so I couldn't call anybody. I couldn't do anything but just sit there with myself, sick. Um, Did you feel hopeless at that point? Yes, I was very hopeless. I was completely hopeless at that point. So Stephanie's mom is part of our prayer team that meets early mornings. And I, if I had a nickel for every morning she had us pray for you, uh, it, it was it was it was a lot, and I believe that God has heard the prayers of a mom. And we're going to get back to you in just a second. And I want you guys to meet Martin and Annie, awesome couple. Um, how long have you guys been coming to the harbor? Probably four, or five years. Okay. Five years. Yeah. So um, you guys have an incredible story. Um, Martin served two tours in the Middle East in, the, in our military, and uh, isn't that awesome? Right? Is that true? Yep. One, one and a half. One and a half. Well, it was cut short, the second one. So, um, and uh, they're, they're just an amazing couple. Could you um, uh, kind of share with us the event that took place um, that, that kind of, I know you guys were, you knew each other. No, let's go back. Let's just go back. How you first met. I think that's a great story. How you guys first met. I picked him up at the subway station. She literally did. I did. Um, I was coming off from work. Uh, it was around midnight, and I had missed the Long Island. I lived in Manhattan. I um, I missed the Long Island Railroad by 30 minutes, so I was like, I'm just gonna take the train. And 
as I'm going down the escalator, I saw him and his partner standing there. Now, now you have to know that Martin is an NYPD police officer. He's now a detective. Isn't that awesome? And, uh, and you, you are a flight attendant. So you were just getting off work. Getting off work. And it was the uniform. You laid eyes on him, I laid and eyes that on was him it. And that was it. Okay. I saw him, and I stared at him. I don't know how long until his partner started laughing. Then I realized that I was staring at him, and I had to break. You know, Kim. It was the same story with Kim and I. <laughs> she, she just didn't know what to say. Okay, go ahead. Go. So I go downstairs, and I remember watching um, Heroes on my little iPod, and I was getting bothered by a drunk guy, and I was starting to get uncomfortable because he would start touching my hair, and he would start touching my arms, and just the force was just like, you know, just go back to where the policemen were so that I would feel safer, and yeah, I just, I had to. I, I, was, had to I was diligently paying attention. <laughs> so, so you actually walked up to him with your name and number on a piece of my, paper and gave it to him. On a piece of paper, and I said, here. And he's like, what's this? I'm like, my number, call me if you're single. And he said, I am and I will. So, <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a great story? <laughs> the uniform, man. I'm telling you, it's the uniform. So she said it was your eyes. It was it oh. was his eyes. So I you, just stared into you his guys eyes. were together for a while, and then you went back to was it Afghanistan? Is that for the second deployment? For yeah, the second, I was, I was heading to Afghanistan. So tell us about what happened in that training exercise, and just how your world really took a left turn. I think they would love to hear that. Yeah, it was I was doing a uh, training exercise, and um, I was hit with a, a training round. I don't know if there's any military people here, but it was a sim round, and it burnt both my legs, similar to... Uh, Come on, we're part of that what, group, what, brother. What Pastor Mike went through here. So I was kind of laid up for probably probably almost a half a year, maybe a year with the burns. You had third-degree burns. How, how, how much of your body was burned? 33%, if that helps. So but your it legs... from the back of my... Yeah, okay. pretty much all the way down. Okay. So then you, got, you, were getting, um, you were getting some pushback. They wouldn't let you visit him because you weren't... You weren't a spouse at that point. Yeah, at that point, we were engaged. But in military eyes, we were just boyfriend and girlfriend. So how, what did you do to solve that problem? I married him in the hospital. Isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> That's so awesome. So um, you're, you're, you're married, um, you're dreaming for this great life, but you, 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 as years went on, you struggled in the marriage. Your marriage was in trouble. Can you just kind of speak to that for a second? Sure. I, I had, um, I, de I deployed previously, 2003, 2004. Um, the job, you know, coming from my own history, I was struggling with a lot of demons. You know, I was struggling with... Um, my past, the way I was raised, um, if you if you want to call it PTSD, PTSD. So um, I was self-medicating, probably. Yeah, would be self medicating yeah. yeah, for sure. I was I was severely severely broken. Mm -hmm. And we really didn't know how to love each other because we weren't brought up how to love one another the godly way. So I. I only knew how to love him the way that I knew how, which was feeding into each other's sins. Mm -hmm. We get it. Um, so, um, Stephanie, you're you're broken. You're you're in jail. You are feeling like your daughter's taken away from you. You're feeling all alone. Um, what begin? What happened in your life that started you um, on that journey to finding Christ? Like what what happened? Uh, what, what are the events that took place that brought you to a place where you said, Lord, I'm just giving you everything? Uh, can you share that with us? Yes. Um, my mother came to visit me in jail, and um, I was really broken. And um, she reminded me of a story from when I was younger, and I went with her um, on a retreat, a woman's retreat. I had to be 16 or 17, maybe. And... She sat there and she reminded me, I was, we were there with a bunch of women and the speaker came over to me and she spoke over me and um, 
my mother reminded me of that story, and she, I don't remember exactly what she said, but my mom told me, she said, you know, remember what that lady said. She said that the devil hates you, and he's going to try to take you out because you will be a strong woman of God. And um, she's like, this was him trying to take you out, and you can do something. Like, he spared your life, and don't, don't take that lightly. Um, and it was like at that point, I went back into my jail cell, and I was just finally done. I was totally, utterly done for the first time in a very, in, in ever, you know? I've tried to do this my way, the doctor's way, and that's when I made the decision to do this God's way, because there was no other way I was gonna get out of that. And so a year ago started that process where you uh, started to um, serve God and, and with all of the brokenness, trust him to put all things together. I have a great um, little caveat I want to share with this. So when we had our conference here in August um, and knowing what God had been doing in your life at that point, which hadn't been that long, um, we were sold out. We were completely sold out. And you called and said, can me and a friend come to the conference? And we were like... We, uh, we, don't have any, we don't have any spots available, but we just felt, Pastor Scott felt completely compelled to make that available. So you and your friend, a young man named Matt, sat right in the second row. And <clears throat> little did we know, uh, and Matt was struggling with heroin addiction, and, and he was in trouble with the law. He, he, same, same as you. <clears throat> Some of you that were at the conference remember the night that Carl Lentz spoke. And Carl Lentz, for some reason, turned around and his, he was sitting right behind. Uh, he was in front of us. Yeah, and he said something kind of joking around. And in his message, he came down off the platform and went and hugged Matt or put him in a headlock or something as a joke. <laughs> and it was just hilarious. Yes. But we didn't know what was going on. Matt ended up giving his life to Christ. Yep. Now listen to this. Matt <clears throat> now runs our HA meeting, Heroin Anonymous meeting at Patchog. They have 45 to 50 people going to that HA meeting. Matt runs that. He's an integral part of the Patchogue team, and they, he just went to Pastor Scott a few uh, months ago and said, hey, some of the guys know we study the Bible. Can we have a Bible study after the HA? It's like 10 o'clock at night on Friday nights. They're studying the Bible, and he's got a whole row of, of people that were going to HA in the front row at Patchogue at 89 North at our services there. And that was because you invited him to the conference. And isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Talk to us. How did, what happened that brought you to that place where you said, God, you can have it all. I surrender my life to you. I think for, for that to make sense, you have to understand that I'm, deliberately walked away from God. I mean, there was a point in my life I remember leaving church and spitting the Eucharist in my hand and being like, I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. You know, I've, I've given you all. And in my mind, I wasn't getting anything in return. And there was no investment. Um, and I dealt with the repercussions from that, you know, which was um, a, life, a life without Jesus. It looks exactly what you think it looks like, you know. So if you, I've, I've broken every law. And I'll stand before you and tell you I've broken every one. If you're thinking, well, is he talking about that one? The answer is yeah. Yeah, I broke that one. So um, I was, I dealt with the, the void. You know, I dealt with the sadness. And, I, and that started to become toxic in my relationships. It was toxic in my workplace. It was toxic in, in every way you can imagine it being toxic. You know? Now, you ended up going to the biker church, uh, Pastor Ski. And he actually was a big part of discipling you. And, uh, th and is that where you found Christ? I, I actually got water baptized in Kuwait. So the, where I found Christ, where I have really found him, was in Samara. <laughs> I mean, if that, if that makes sense to anybody. I w just hearing, being that close, I think, um, geographically. And then just like saying the Psalms and, and seeing the Tower of Babel and 
that's where I found, well, that's where Christ found me. <laughs> I wasn't looking for Christ. He found he me. He was chasing after you, bro. <laughs> so you were going to the biker church, um, and, it's, and it's, it's, a, it's a church that's really reaching people that are unchurched, and, and so you have a little beautiful little daughter, Leighton, and, and, uh, and so how, what did you think of what was going on in his life? Well, for a long time, um, I oh, well, let's go back a little bit. Um, I've always believed in the higher power. I just didn't know. I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know God. And, you know, I love this man with all my heart, with all my soul. Like, he is my, he is my number one, you know, before Christ. And when he used to call me, I would used to say, the world has to stop. This is my man. And I used to think that the way that I love him, I couldn't help him through his PTSD. And when he found Christ for about a year, the, the change that I saw in him, I'm like, Jesus must be real. Because how can my love not change and help him? And he's, he's, you know, he's always been a great father. He's always been a great husband. But the way that he loves me now through with Jesus guidance and Jesus being center has completely changed our relationship. Wow. It's amazing. And so you understood that with your daughter you needed to be in an environment that would had ministry to kids and everything. So you come here to the harbor 5 years ago and you guys are struggling in your marriage. You're struggling communicating, you're struggling with you know all of that, and then you started um, uh, taking advantage of some of our marriage opportunities. And can you, because there might be someone here that's you know, you know every uh, listen. First of all, every guy thinks all oh, my marriage is great. You talk to the wife, oh we're falling apart. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. So don't ever ask the guy. Ask the wife. She'll tell you the real story. So share with us uh, a little bit about um, being a part of Vinnie and Marianne's marriage class, and and just how God began to teach you guys how to. Uh, be a great husband and great wife to one another. Just put a plug in there for that. Um, well, when we took the class, I, we got, I got to be honest, a lot of stuff didn't really bother us. The main thing was that we had a lot of secrets. Mm -hmm. We each have our own secrets that we didn't feel like we were able to share. Like if I, I felt like if I sh told him my secret, he wouldn't love me anymore. And we you think the same thing for you, right? I think another big part is that um, our roles are a little wacky. Like, I'm the one that's like, well, why won't you touch me and talk to me? And she's like, eh. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so I, think, I think the marriage class kind of, uh, it kind of helped us to... Um, we won't tell anyone about that, It's Martin. too late. No, it's out it's, there. Yeah. it's between us. Yeah. It's between us. Yeah, because a lot of uh, the classes we were going through, I would look at him and I don't identify that way. I'm like, did you want some more touching? Yeah, if, if, if this, this is God's cosmic joke that, that we're together, because we, we perfectly complement each other. So, I mean, the, the marriage class, if, if like I was talking to Pastor Mike before this, if you don't think your marriage is broken without Jesus, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. And you won't, you won't, you won't have that framework to understand that until you actually insert, you know, Jesus into the center of all that. Can I add something? I actually didn't think our marriage was broken or headed towards brokenness until we found God together. Uh, so it, like God uncovered some things and you realize it's bigger than you. You, you, need, you need someone bigger to help. That's, that's awesome. And, um, and their daughter, Leighton, I'm telling you, she is a rock star. She's probably going to be up here leading us in worship in a few years. How old is Leighton? Nine. Nine years old. She's amazing. So, Stephanie, um, you made that decision to, to surrender your life to Christ and start walking with him. Um, so let's fast forward. How is life different now than it was a year ago? And, 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 and kind of share with everyone about your, your, your daughter, like, um, like how that's changed. Because okay, um, the, we left them hanging. They took your daughter away, right? Oh, yes. Okay. Um, well, my life is very different than it was a year ago. I mean, a year ago, I was just one day out of jail this day. So I had no plan. I knew I didn't want to go back to using drugs. I knew I wanted to change, but I didn't know how or where to begin. Um, so 
I wound up getting in touch with somebody who had an HA meeting that she wanted me to go to and she was relentless. She wouldn't let me say no. And I got there and she was a Christian and all her friends were Christians and I, they helped me and kind of guided me to rehab. Um, and I went through the, the process. I did everything I was told to do. I did my inpatient and I went to outpatient and I, I took every suggestion that was given to me. I came back to church, I prayed, I worshiped on my own. I really like dove in um, and I did everything I possibly, possibly could. And I have too broken a lot of laws. So I had a lot of legals to deal with and um, my daughter with CPS and family court and um, they gave me a list of things I had to do and it was hard because I couldn't see her. I, was, I went from not seeing her at all and then I would only have one hour of supervised visits with her and, and it was, this was all very hard. Um, but I wound up seven months in, I was seven months clean and we went to family court and then usually I would go and it would just get adjourned, 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 pending treatment, pending treatment. And um, the judge looked at my file and said that my progress was incredible and they vacated my neglect case that day and it was very unexpected. Um, yeah. So, so is she in children's church today? Huh? Is she in children's church? She's not. Okay. All right. No. Um, so let me ask you. Uh, let me ask you this. So um, a year later, I mean, first of all, and I think everyone would agree, you're absolutely beautiful, and there's a glow around you. You'd never know that just a year ago you were broken. And. Um, We are so proud of you. Thank you. And I've watched you grow this year, and you are going after God with all your heart and your soul and your mind, and it's awesome. There might be people in this room today that are struggling with addiction, and it's, it's kind of like the elephant in the room. No one wants to talk about it, but I know for a fact there are people here today that are wrestling with it could be alcohol, it could be prescription drugs, it could be heroin. You know what? The end result is the same in all of them. Um, and um, what, what would you tell that person if they're sitting here today struggling, feeling like they can't tell anyone? What would you tell them? I would tell them that you have to tell someone. I, the very reasons why I stayed in active addiction were the very reasons I should have stopped. And if you're holding on to those secrets, and I know I was in a place where I was, it was so much chaos and there were so many secrets and so many lies that the thought of coming clean to get help was terrifying. And that fear keeps you in active addiction, but it will only get worse from there. Um, no matter how bad you feel it is where you are today, the progression of this is very real, and you will eventually be in a worse spot where it will be even harder to come clean, so the best thing to do is just get the help. You would be amazed at the support. You know, I was so afraid of admitting that I was this mother who was a drug addict, and I didn't want to say that out loud, and like I said, that kept me actively using the fear of coming clean. But when I, it wasn't even my choice, I just, it came out through what happened. Um, so it wasn't my choice to say it, I, it just all came out, but it was the best thing that ever happened. And the support that I received was beyond what I would have imagined. There was much less judgment than I thought would, uh, there would be, and so much more support. And, um, I understand how hard it can be to take that first step and admit you have a problem and, and want to get the help, but it will only get harder. It always does, and it just gets worse. So, And Jesus made all the difference in the world in the process. Yes. Because your soul was healthy. Yeah. 
And that makes all the difference, right? Amen. Guys, what would you say to the person here today um, that's tried to do this without him? You know, they've tried to do the marriage thing. They've tried to live their life without him. What advice would you give that person that might be here today? I, I, you can listen to both of our stories, all of our stories. There is no difference between us. You know, we're, we're both lawbreakers. We both, right? We both tried self-medicating. We both tried doing it our own way. Um, it's not possible. It's not possible. You know, and I, I think you, you, the further down that hole you go, the more it becomes apparent that it's not possible. Yeah. You know, so it, it really, I, I hope the theme that sticks out is um, there's only one way to fix relationships, to fix addiction, to fix whatever hole you're, you're plugging in with whatever vice it may be. It's Jesus. You know, that's it. And I just want to say that, you know, when I first came to Christ, you know, I know not much of him. And my favorite chapter, uh, I'm sorry, my favorite book in the Bible is the book of John. And start there. Start there. And so life is different today than it was. Absolutely. Yes. There's no comparison. There's no, no comparison. No. And, um, and it's funny. Um, I believe that there's such an incredible calling on all three of you to just reach people and to minister to love people. And, and it's there. And uh, we, we just love you guys so much. We're so proud of you. And I've had the privilege of watching your journey. And, uh, you know, when, whenever you get to a point where you're like, God, God, why aren't there miracles today? Let me tell you, there are miracles all around you if you look. And here's three of them right here. Thank you so much, you guys, for being willing to come up here. Come on, let's give it up for these guys. Um, I just want to close with a scripture, and then we're going to have our worship team come back out, and they're going to lead us in a, in a song or two just to glorify God. Don't you feel full today and just blessed? And I just want to say again, if you need help in any way, call us. Call the office. We know where to send, we know where to send you to get help. We know um, you're, you're never going to find condemnation or judgment at the harbor, no matter what you're going through. We want to help, and we want to be a blessing to you. First Peter 1 says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. You saw expectation in these three lives today that, that they didn't have before. And we have a priceless inheritance, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. Could we just stand for just a minute and... Um, I just want to encourage you. You might be here today, and maybe it's your first time, or maybe you've been attending a while, and today something's different. Today you feel in your heart this, this void. You feel like, man, I need to have a relationship with my Creator. It's not about the harbor. It's not about joining a church. It's not about a denomination. It has nothing to do with any of that. It's about having a personal friendship, a personal relationship with the God that gave his life for you so that you could be free. And so I want to just um, close in a prayer, and, and, and I'd like to just ask everyone to pray it with me, just because um, for some it's going to be difficult to take that step, but it just, it, when you're in an environment of faith, it builds your faith. And so would you mind, we're, we're going to pray a prayer of uh, invitation to ask the Lord into our life. It's not the prayer. It has nothing to, the, the prayer is just to help guide you. Uh, it has to do with your heart. You understand that? And it's God is, God is the one, the relationship with him is the one that changes us. So would you just pray with me today? Dear Lord, thank you for bringing me here today. I realize my need for you, my need to be forgiven, my need to be changed. So, Today, I fully surrender all of my life to you, Lord. I want to know you. I want your presence to dwell in my life. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins. 
and I ask you to transform my life. Give me the strength and the faith to follow you every day on the difficult days and on the great days. Jesus, be Lord of my life today. In your name, amen.